Hey, guys. Um, I, uh, hi, good morning. I'm Johnny, and a lot of you are new, so nice to meet you. Um, I like to uh, connect with students on Facebook and Twitter like everybody born in the 21st century, but I wasn't that, actually, but, you know, growing up now. And uh, last night, just for a little bit of fun, I decided to post on my uh, Facebook page um, a question, and, and here was the question. Uh, anyone want to give some advice to freshmen? Comment below, okay? And I received 128 comments in like an hour, okay? And uh, I, I thought I would read you some of those like kind little um, tidbits. I've, I've taken away the mean ones, and you know, so I'll give you some funny ones, some combo ones, and then we'll uh, we'll move on here here today. But I love Facebook and Twitter. It's a great way to connect, right? You can go to Facebook.com Johnny Online or Twitter slash Johnny M. And uh, we, can, we can connect that way. But here's some, here's some general advice, okay? Uh, Megan says, don't wear Crocs in public if you want to make new friends, okay? <laughs> uh, and this came from you guys, okay? So, you know, I'm, I'm innocent if, if this is offensive. Uh, Alex said, college is simple. Grades, sleep, friends, pick two. <laughs> uh, here's Kevin. Don't use your Flames cash to buy everyone pizza. Because then you run out, Okay. And then you, you end up like sitting on the front steps of Damas with a, you know, we'll, we'll uh, work for food sign, okay? Uh, Jeremy says, don't do silly things like proposing in the, com uh, proposing in the computer lab because uh, they'll make LU memes out of you, okay? And uh, my, my, probably my favorite one maybe, and you, you'll know where this came from, perhaps from Chris. Uh, whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. <laughs> for, for example, buy a venti frappuccino from the bookstore on your way to the La Haye Student Center to work out. You know. Um, so here's some convocation advice. Always buy your convo tickets from me, Cody says, $5 a pop. To which Isaac replied, I offer convo tickets for $3. Stay away from this overcharging charlatan freshman. To which an alumnus replied, what? They're charging for convo now? <laughs> Me Megan says, if you ever see a flyer saying that Tim Tebow is going to be speaking in combo that week, don't believe it, okay? Um, Wes says, be nice to Johnny Moore, which I appreciate, okay? And of course, there wasn't, I'll just do a few more here. There wasn't a, a shortage of relationship advice because, you know, this is Liberty University, right? And we're kind of focused on that. Joshua said, just go ahead and break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend now before spiritual hymns this week or Clayton King will make you do it, Okay. To, to which Andrew replied, do not use God as an excuse to break up. <laughs> to which uh, Topher replied, freshmen should not date, period. To which Jen replied, don't date, you're a freshman. To which Tyler replied, don't date, you're a freshman. To which Pat replied, that guy sitting on the bench in the circle playing guitar, solid dude. <laughs> Husband material for you and his five girlfriends. <laughs> and, then, and then lots of serious stuff like trusting God completely. You know, I'm amazed at what God has done in my life at this university. Don't take college as a joke. Study, you know, pick your friends wisely, you know, or of course the, the wisely profound Kim who said, go to classes, simple enough. So there, there's lots of college advice, right? For you, tons of college advice. As soon as this convocation is over, a lot of you are going to go off to freshman seminar. The other of you are going to go off to another seminar. Everybody's going to be giving you advice. Some of your parents have been giving you advice for college since you were like in the womb, okay? You know, mom was whispering to you, one day you're going to go to college, and when you do so, you're going to study and do good on your classes. I mean, advice is coming from everywhere. You know, some, some of your parents are overachievers, and so they bought you books to read, which you acted like you read, but you really didn't read. You're on Facebook in your room, Okay. Advice is coming from every direction. And I want to I join in the, the, the cacophony of noise this morning and give you three words of advice as you begin your, your Liberty University experience as freshmen here today. Three simple words of advice. You don't even have to write these down. You'll, you'll remember these. They're, they're really, really simple words of advice. Here, here's the first one. Jesus gave you a good brain. Use it. Okay. Number two, Jesus made you a person. Be good at it. 
And number three, Jesus is giving you a chance. Don't waste it, okay? Those are the three words of advice. And I'll start with the first one. Jesus gave you a good brain, use it, okay? The issue here at college, at Liberty University, with all the nervousness that arriving on campus as a freshman produces, it's not like, it's not what you have to work with. It's what you do with it that matters when you arrive on this place. You have to have intentionality. You're going to have to be responsible. You're going to face challenges that you've never faced before. You know, for instance, navigating this campus, right? It's like a maze for the first week or so. It's amazing, but it's also a maze. Buildings going up everywhere. It's like our our chancellor said the other day to uh, a group of faculty members. He's not sure if this is a campus under construction or if this is a construction project with a campus, you know, in the center of it. Lots of things happening. You'll get in a bus and you think you're going to class and you end up in downtown Lynchburg, okay? And you didn't even know there was a downtown Lynchburg and you'll be wandering around. You're, you'll for, for sure at least once show up in a class that isn't your class, okay? And the teacher will start the class, and because you're all studious, you're going to sit on the front row, and you got your big smile on your face, and you actually bought a pencil because you thought college students use pencils, and and you're not going to like use your iPhone or your laptop to take notes. You're going to you got a you got a notepad, and you're sitting there, and you even bought the books for the class, and it is like biology 101, and the professor starts, "Welcome to history 495," and you're going to be sitting on the front row of that class, and you got a decision to make. Are you going to leave your desk and do Liberty's version of a walk of shame, okay? While, while all, all the seniors in the class are whispering, you know, that must be a freshman, you know? <laughs> and, and leave the class in shame, or are you just going to sit there? You, well, you should sit there, of course, and act like a senior for a little. Everybody will know you're a freshman, but you'll save yourself a little embarrassment, okay? Lots of things are going to happen. You're, you're going to be, like, wandering around the hallways. You're not going to know what's going on. You, you're... You're just going to wake up, and you don't know where you are. You know, it's like when you travel a lot, and you wake up, and you don't know what city you're in. You're in college. You're at Liberty University. But at this place, you're going to have to use your brain, and not just in those perfunctory ways. You're going to have to use your brain because this is college, and that's, that's what it's meant for. You know, Jesus gave you a brain, and you've got to use it. Your brain is a gift from God. That's what it is. It's a gift from God. And maybe you've never thought about your brain, but Jesus thinks about it a lot, I, I believe. You know, in fact, almost as quickly as we have creation in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2, what do we have? God commanding Adam to use his brain. What does God tell Adam to do? Name the animals. That's not an easy task. Have you ever thought of a name for an animal? Aardvark? You know, just imagine something, right? Try to imagine a name for an animal, okay? Like a walla walla woo woo or something, you know? A, it, had, it involved using your brain. I mean, from square one, God commanded Adam to use his brain. It was a gift of God. It's the human mind that has created the medicine that heals our bodies, that envisions the, the dreams that make the world a better place. It's the human mind that has done all kinds of amazing things throughout history, that we are here today because of the mind, and God gave it to you. You, you know, your brain processes 70,000 thoughts a day, 70,000 identifiable thoughts a day. If you're of course, a freshman boy, 65,000 of those involve girls, okay? Um, but you know, 70,000 thoughts a day. That go, you know, one, one scientist uh, described the human brain. He said if it were a car, it would drive at 268,000 miles an hour. I mean, your brain is like so complicated. It's, a, it's amazing. It's incredible. God gave it to you. It's a gift, but it's also a muscle that you have to work out. You've you got to put stuff into it to get stuff out of it. Now, from the time you're a little kid, you've been taught maybe that you have a left brain and a right brain, right? Your left brain is like analytical and your right brain is creative. And some of you are creative, right? So you draw things. You paint pictures and you put them on your wall. And your mama, your whole life has told you that they're beautiful. They're not, okay? And you're, you're going to put them on your wall in your dorm and people are going to make fun of you, okay? Because they're not beautiful. But you're, you're creative. You know, you're like a flower of various shades of color. And then some of you are like analytical and and you look at that piece of paper with like a bunch of paint on the wall and you're thinking, man, what kind of equation could I make out of that thing, you know? It's like two two different parts of your brain, right? The right brain, the left brain. You've been conditioned to think that you're this type of person. But you know, Jesus is concerned about your whole person and you ought to challenge yourself in different ways. You know, some of you, you arrived here and you came here on faith because you've been told your entire life, you're not college material. That's a lie because God made that brain in your head. God has a plan for your life and you have to challenge yourself. You, just like I, I, I am to work my muscles if I'm to become strong, you have to work the muscle of your mind. 
You know, this week I, I learned about how the human brain learns how to play an instrument. You know, some of you are band members. You played instruments since you were a little kid. And, you know, like if you learn the violin, you know, it's amazing what your brain does. Your, your brain, as you're learning like an instrument, like the violin, it rearranges the neurons to remember the things that you did as you were learning the, the violin. And then while all that's happening, your brain is instructing your fingers to go stronger. It's strengthening your eye-hand coordination. Like amazing things are happening inside of your head. Like that's something God has given to you. It's a gift of God. It's a muscle that has to be worked out. And it works better than you think it does. Now, I know, like, if you've spent the last four years on Facebook, you know, you, you might not have even thought about your mind, okay, right? I mean, we live in this social media world where, you know, we <clears throat> can't stop looking at our cell phone for like five seconds, right? There was these scientists, and they did a test of, of high school students, and they took away their cell phones for a, a few minutes, a few hours, actually. And do you know they exhibited the same behaviors as an addict when you take their drugs away? They were reaching for invisible phones. They were fidgeting because they, they didn't have their, their drug, okay? Uh, the scientists tell us that your attention span as a generation, and I'm, I'm very close in that mix, is like five seconds compared to 12 minutes only 10 years ago. See, there's this UCLA study that said five hours of surfing on the internet will change the way your brain works because your brain adjusts to stimuli and experiences. Your brain is made to customize itself for the way God has, has designed you. And you know what happens? Like when you, when you can't control that stuff in your life is you end up like your life is out of, out of control. And I'm a huge fan of technology, right? I mean, I, I just told you, like, I you know, like to communicate on Facebook and Twitter and things. I love the internet, you know, researching. is like a whole different thing in college now than it was like 20 years ago because of the internet. We, we'll have Facebook church at some point this year where people all around the world will join us for church. I mean, I'm a huge fan of like technology, but you've got to understand that you've got to have discipline over that stuff in your life. You've got to put it aside. You've got to study. You've got to do your thing. And if you're wondering whether this is biblical, it is biblical. The Bible's full of things about your mind. Like 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, where it says, prepare your mind for action. That, that's what you're doing now. You're preparing your mind for action. You're going to be in freshman seminar and your teacher is going to tell you how to study and how to prepare. And you go buy your books and you, you know, lay out your calendar, your iCal, and you, you put your assignments in there and you, you prepare uh, for all of that. I mean, you've got to prepare your mind for action. The, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 that God's divine power has given you everything you need for life and for godliness. He's given you what you need, the brain inside of, inside of your head. You know, Daniel chapter 2, verse 21 says, God gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the understanding. What, what was God saying? When, what was Daniel writing about when he said that? God gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the understanding. He didn't say God gives wisdom to the dumb, right? He didn't say God gives knowledge to the ignorant. He says God gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge uh, to the understanding. What is he saying? He's saying you've got a foundation to work on. And God has given you that foundation in your life. And as you prepare for classes, you prepare for college, you look at that assignment, you sit in that first day of class and, and the professor goes by the syllabi and you think, I cannot do this. I have never written a paper this big in my entire life. I, you know, I got to read more in this single class than I have like to date in my in, you know, in, entire time of existence. You know, when you're sitting down, you're looking at that. Never doubt that the God who brought you here is the God who will help you complete this task. Prepare your mind for action. Action. I, was, I, was, I learned this week that in 1991, there was a World Memory Championship. And this guy uh, memorized an entire deck of cards, 52 cards, and get this, five minutes. Five minutes. A year later, a year ago, sorry, 2011, it was 1991. 2011, the record was broken. A German guy memorized 52 cards, 21 seconds. You see, we have no idea what God's put inside of our heads. Jesus gave you a good brain, use it. Number two, Jesus made you a person, be good at it. Jesus made you a person, right? 
a whole person. You've got a mind and body and you get emotions and you get a will. Like Jesus is concerned about your whole person. He's concerned about your soul. He's concerned about your mind. And, and Jesus is really concerned about how we treat one another. I mean, the, the Bible is very clear about this. There's this powerful moment in scripture where a Pharisee asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answers the question. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know that verse probably. But what I think is interesting is that Jesus volunteers the second commandment. The guy didn't ask him what the second greatest commandment is, but what did Jesus tell him? Jesus said, and the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is very concerned with how we treat one another. And here you are at college. And if you're going to be successful here, you have to understand that you have to care for other people more than you care for yourself. You, you have to cultivate the fruit of the spirit in your life. So you treat people well. You treat them sometimes not how they deserve to be treated, but better than they deserve. Because that's what Jesus has done to us. As Jesus has given us grace, we have to give grace to other people. You know, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, in humility, we should count others more significant than we count ourselves. We should count others of greater value. Now you have been taught and I've been taught growing up in America and growing up in the 21st century, regardless of what country you're from, that you have to look out for number one. Like you're the most important. You're the center of your story. But Jesus comes on to history and he says, I made a totally different rule. It's not what's good for you. It's what's good for the world through you. Treat other people, not the way they deserve to be treated, but the way I have treated you. That, that's why the Bible says things like, this is my commandment, John chapter 15, verse 12, that you love one another as I have loved you. It, it, it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. We have to live in a way that we love one another. I mean, the fruit of the Spirit, right? You, you learn that from the time you're a little kid, if you were in church, Awana, singing a little song, the fruit of the spirit, la, 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 la. I never learned the song, but I know there's a song. And it says things like, what is the fruit of the spirit? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, all these things you're gonna have in your life, all important things. If you don't have patience, man, you're gonna, you're gonna run out of it really quick when you're on a single college campus with 12,000 other people, okay? If you had a problem with that one kid in your school of like 300 people annoying you, well, prepare. There are like more people here to annoy you than you've ever seen in your entire life, okay? Because we're different. We're just diverse. God made us different. And you have to learn patience. You've got to, you need joy that transcends your circumstances. You're going to have bad days and good days. You're going to pass tests and you're going to fail tests. You're going to have progress. And then you, as soon as you get two steps forward, you're going to be not five steps back. And you've got to have joy that causes you to carry on. Not just happiness, not what you feel, but what you know is true. But where does all that come from, the fruit of the Spirit? Well, the Bible tells us. In Galatians chapter 5, it says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. When it says the fruit of the Spirit, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22-ish, is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, all, all those other things. In the biblical language, the word love is singular. It's not plural, which, let me tell you what that means. The, the biblical writer is saying that it is from love that all these other things come out in your life. If you want to be a patient person, you need to work on self-control in your life, or you're kind of a depressive person and you need joy in your life. If you need gentleness because you're brash and you're tough, the Bible says you don't, you've got to begin with love. You love people the way Jesus loved you. Now, this is going to be tested this semester and your entire college life for two reasons. Because in college, you have to dodge the two great potholes uh, of loving people as Jesus would have you love people, of being the person Jesus has designed you to be. Two, the two great potholes, roommates and relationships, okay? Uh, it, uh, it's complicated. I, I don't know who had this idea like 300 years ago that we ought to put two totally different people in a 10 by 10 room or three people or 17 people. And we don't know where they're from. They're from, you know, she's from Massachusetts. She's from Mississippi. You know, the, the, the one girl is, you know, is like a, a adult, right? She's coming to college to be an adult. She's going to get her career. I mean, she's serious and she's focused. And her roommate is still in middle school. She has One Direction posters all over her wall, you know? 
I, I didn't even know what One Direction was, by the way, until uh, the Olympics, the closing ceremony. And, you know, they, they were in the closing ceremony, this, you know, new boy band thing. And so I, I asked my wife, you know, what is, what is One Direction? And, you know, she knew. She said, it's like five Justin Biebers, you know, <laughs> all, all put together. But, but roommates are complicated. You know, at some point in your career at Liberty University, you will be in a room with somebody that is drastically different from you. Somebody whose personality does not match your personality. Some of you are already saying, amen, amen, amen. I don't know what I've gotten myself into, you know. But that is like God's design for you. I, I know it's hard to believe, but iron sharpens iron. People sharpen people. And maybe you grew up in your own little culture, in your own little city, and you know, you're just, you're just all on, on your own. You're very independent. You, you haven't been exposed to people that are different than your family or your culture or your church or your school. And all of a sudden, you know, you are living with someone that's drastically different from you. You know, without Jesus, this is not possible. Okay, without Jesus, roommates are, are not possible. They have the success rate of like, you know, a Tom Cruise marriage or something. Okay, you know, it just, it just doesn't work. You know, roommates, without Jesus, it, it's like, it just won't work. It's like Democrats and Republicans treating each other like adults, you know. So, like without, without Jesus, you know, it, it, just, it just doesn't work. You can have G and I, I, I don't mean to be like the little church guy saying, if you have Jesus, everything's going to be okay. But you know what? If you have Jesus, things are going to be okay, right? Because Jesus is going to challenge you to become like him. And Jesus interacted with lots of people that were very different from him. And he had lots of patience with lots of people. And so some of you, you're facing this immediately. You know, you're like a hipster skater and your roommate wears polo pajamas, you know. And <laughs> it's, just, it's just the way it is. You're an animal rights activist, okay. And your roommate almost didn't come to Liberty because we wouldn't let him bring his meat freezer, you know. It's just th these conflicts will happen. You know, my, my favorite uh, roommate story, if I can just go on a tangent for just a second, uh, happened a few years ago, and this is the way it was told to me, so I don't know if it's true, but it sounds true, um, and I, I knew the person that told it to me, but there was this girl that moved in, and she was like frou-frou. I mean, she, she was, you know, like, like pink everywhere, you know, very, very sophisticated. I mean, she, she, she just moved in her room like it was her house, okay? And her roommate hadn't moved in yet, and so she thought she was all alone, right? And so this looks like, you know, you, you walk in and there's classic music playing, and, you know, it's, it's beautiful. And, and she had this white fur rug, okay? Like made out of real animal fur, okay? Laid on the ground. I mean, when you step on it, your feet have a party, you know, and it just feels so good. And she's got this white fur rug on the ground. And so she goes away to the bookstore to get her books or something. And while she's gone for a few hours, her roommate moves in. And her roommate is like a grungy, you know, kind of cause obsessed, wear, wears the same clothes for 14 days, had to cut off her dreadlocks to come to, you know, Liberty. And, and she's got her little cause bracelets wrapped all the way up the, uh, the bedpost, you know. And, and so she gets all situated in, in the other half of the room. And she has this big, she's cause obsessed, right? So she's got this big, huge poster on the wall. And the poster says, save Darfur, you know, Darfur is the region in Sudan where hundreds of thousands of people were killed by, um, by government-funded Muslim hordes, okay? It was a big cause a few years ago. Save Darfur, D-A-R-F-U-R, Darfur. It's a region. Save Darfur. we got to save Darfur. It's a huge poster on the wall. So then she goes away to do some things. And then her roommate comes back, the frou-frou one. And she walks into her room expecting to walk into nirvana, you know, and peace and happiness. And all of a sudden she realizes that, that some crazy person moved in a room and then she sees the poster and apparently Miss Frufru didn't do really well in English because the way she read save Darfur she read it as save the fur <laughs> and so 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 she, she's freaking out. She's concerned for her life, you know, because there's the fur. It's real fur, you know, laying on the ground. And she's attached to that. You know, she's a little baby. And mama put her on that little fur rug. She's had it her, her whole life. And her roommate's going to kill her because she killed the animal. But she didn't kill the animal. You know, it's just her rug. And so she runs out and she tells her RA, you know, I can't live in this room. I can't live in this room. I, you know, she freaks out, which is what we do when we're uncomfortable. You'll do that when you get in class. Things won't go so well. And you'll like freak out. I'm going to fail. You know, I can't do this college thing. You just need to take your riddle and calm down, you know, 
And, and the RA explained to her that Darfur is a region in Africa, and maybe you ought to take an introduction to history, you know? <laughs> so, a funny story, but, but it's true. You're going to have these kinds of conflicts with people that are different from you. You've got you to get used to that. You know, it's a phrase that somehow sometimes said around here, BFFS, best friend first semester, okay? And it's a disease you can track to roommates. The second one is relationships. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we overdo this here big time. You should not get your ring by spring, okay? You shouldn't do that. But um, when, when, uh, when I read you those, when I read you all those tips from your peers, it's no coincidence that everybody said freshmen should not date, freshmen should not date, freshmen should not date. Yeah, you know, there are exceptions to every rule. But if I could just warn, I'll just give a word of advice to the guys, a word of advice to the girls. Girls, avoid freshmen men at all costs because they're not men, they're boys. Okay. And, and. And you have to really, really watch out for the ones that grew up in small towns and went to tiny little schools because they, there were no pretty girls in those schools, and, except for their cousin, and, you know, that's not fair. And so, they, they, uh, so when they came to Liberty, they were all of a sudden awakened to the world, and they've never seen so many pretty girls in their life. And so they, they walk around, and you've already mistaken these kids for, like, some, you know, drug addict that Grandma paid to come to Liberty, you know, and they're, they're, they're not high on anything, but they're just like in nirvana also, you know, with all, all these girls around. And, but, but they have just enough courage to talk about dating, but, they, but they'll come up to you and they'll try to ask you on a date, but they'll freeze and they'll start sweating and stuff. And then they, they won't know what to say. And then they, they run away and they do that a few times and then they give up. And that's when they buy uh, the guitar. Okay. That, that, that's when, that's when that happens. And they, it, it and they start like pimping Jesus for a date, basically, you know, you're singing songs to, about Jesus and they don't really love Jesus. They're just lonely and you should really care for them, but don't date them. Okay. Um, and guys, you, you got to watch, watch out for girls that are cute and crazy. Okay. And then, because this is the Facebook era. And if you, if you break up with a girl, this, there is no isolated incident within milliseconds. There's a whole clandestine network. You know, all these girls are connected like the CIA or something. And the word gets around. And all of a sudden, you know, all over Facebook, you know, everybody knows that you are, you are to, you know, they put a big X on you, okay? And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, your life is over. You will never, ever, ever, ever get a date, okay? So, you know, watch out. But, you know, in jest, but in, in reality, relationships are complicated, right? So whether it's roommate relationships or whether it's eventual dating relationship, many of you will find your spouse here, you know, as, as I, I found mine and she's sitting right over there and I promise I wouldn't draw too much attention to her. She's over there and uh, I love her lots, uh, like a, min, a millennia of love, you know, and, and we met here and, and I'm so grateful to God that God introduced me uh, to Andrea and, and, we, and now we're married and we have a wonderful, wonderful life together and it's fantastic. But you know, you have, to be, you have to be careful with this area of your life, okay? And you're gonna need all kinds of pressure. You know, if you're single, prepare to be made fun of, but you know, hold your guns to the right moment, okay? And then, you know, it, and if you see someone that's crying in the middle of the hallway, who's, you know, significant other broke up with them, Sneak up, take a creeper picture, put it online, and put the question, I wonder if they were cheated on, you know, and then you feel better about yourself for a little while. Um, but, <laughs> but, but just joking, let's have fun, okay? Uh, <laughs> but if you do do that, I will laugh, okay? And I'll pray for the other person while I'm laughing. Um, <laughs> But relationships are complicated and you have, to, and it all begins with a very basic thing. If you treat other people the way God has treated you, if you let the fruit of the spirit be evident in your life, if you understand that human beings are made and designed by God, they all have dignity and they deserve to be treated as such. Like you've got to get yourself settled first. Jesus made you a person, be good at it. Like love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Work on your weaknesses. Rather than pointing out all the weaknesses of everybody else, turn the finger first to your own heart. Like the book of James says, look at yourself in the mirror. And like Jesus said to the Pharisees, you got a stinking log sticking out of your eye and you're worried about the speck in someone else's eye. Like you have to look at your own heart. Prepare yourself. And then when that relationship moment comes or if it's just dealing with your roommate or whatever, you will be fit for that. The Bible says do your best to live at peace with everyone. Do your best to do so. You can't control what other people do. And, and the last point in my last couple of minutes is Jesus is giving you a chance. Don't waste it. Jesus is giving you a chance. Don't waste it. You have to make the best of this opportunity. You, you have to understand that God brought you here to this place. And liberty is an amazing place. You know, here, 
here in this place, we're concerned about like your soul as much as your mind and your body. You're going to get the same education here you get anywhere else. You just get something different and something extra. And that is at Liberty University, we have welcomed God who authored all knowledge into the educational process. God, God is not an exile to this campus. God is in the heart of this campus. Like you are in a place of vision, a place of power, a place where you will find your future. And you have to make the best of this opportunity that God has given you. You have to make sure your foundation is set. You, you got to accept Jesus' son as your savior if you haven't done that. You got to like believe in his word as your standard for life. Life. If you haven't made that decision, you've got to accept God's will as your purpose for life. If you haven't come to that place yet, you've got to understand that God's power is your strength in life. Like you've got to get God in his rightful place and set that foundation. But then you've got to get a vision for your life too here. Like you've got to see what could happen in my life. Like this is your blank page. This is your moment. Like anything is possible at this moment. I mean, you're like, you know, 18, you know, some of you 17, some of you 19, maybe there's someone here that's 30, you know, whatever. This is the blank page of your life. This is your chance. You have to ask yourself what our founder used to often say, and that is, what would I do with my life if I knew that I would not fail? If I knew that there was no chance of failing, what would I do with my life? It's like the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5, make the most of every opportunity. This is your chance. You, you didn't come here. God brought you here. Like, God has prepared you. So find out what it is you want to do with your life and do it with all your might and don't let anybody stop you. And don't doubt that with God, all, all things are possible. And, you know, if you're a bad student in high school, listen, I, I wasn't a good student in high school, okay? I wasn't a good student in high school. I had 17 books to read in my AP English class, my junior year of high school. I read zero books, okay? I, I, I wasn't, I, I, when I came to high school, I was, came to college, I was such a bad student. I just didn't even believe I could be, be successful. But, you know, God did some work in my life. And, 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 and finally, I stopped believing what I thought about myself, maybe what some people told me about myself, maybe what my grades had reflected of myself. And I decided that this was my chance, my blank slate. And by God's grace, I, I was able to complete my undergraduate degree. And I was able to find part of the vision for my life and complete another degree and, and, and find my purpose in life in this place. Like God has brought you here. Prepare for what God has, has, has for you. And don't let anything stop you. And if you don't believe in that, if, if you believe some lie that your potential is less than you believe it is, then, then that isn't saying anything about you. That's saying something about God. And God does great things through unlikely people. And, and all through history, the least likely people have been the people that were used by God to do the most extraordinary things. And it's not the people that had all the talents and all the gifts and all the connections and all the success sometimes that have the most significant impact in history. Some of history's great history makers are people that were quietly behind the scenes and people didn't know their names and what they did. And yet through their unassuming lives, they turned the dials of history. This is your moment. This is your blank slate. God brought you here. Now what are you going to do with it? I believe you should do great things with it. And for the parents that are still here this morning, I, I, I believe that your son or daughter is safe in this place. But not only are they safe in this place, but they're going to find a dream or vision for their life that is beyond yours or their wildest dreams. Because that's what God does at Liberty University. This is a place that changes the world. And you're a part of it now. And you should feel the spirit of this moment. Like I want to welcome you to this university. Because it isn't just any university. This is a university where God is up to really remarkable things. And I, I don't know what it is that concerns you, that worries you. Every freshman I've talked about this week has told me they are simultaneously very excited and very, very nervous. And my response every time someone has told me that is that's exactly the way you should be, excited and nervous. It's your nervousness that will make you take this serious and it's your excitement that will inspire you to become the person God has made you to be. So don't get distracted. You came here to get an education, right? Don't get distracted with all, all the other things that are spinning around in your world. But also, God forbid that you take this chance Jesus has given you and you miss your chance to change the world. 
I want to invite you to not just get a university degree at Liberty, but to dare to challenge and to believe that God's plan for your life might be bigger than anything you've ever imagined. Test God. You know why we believe this here? Because 40 years ago, like less than your parents' age, there was no university on this campus. Today, this, camp, this student body is 100,000 students between those studying online and those studying on this campus. Law school, medical school, 200 programs of study. God is changing the world from this place. You are not just a part of a movement. You're a part of a, a movement that is changing history. This isn't just a university. This is an incubator for world changers. It's a greenhouse that will make you grow in ways you never imagined you could. And when it's all said and done, I believe with all of my heart that God will blow your mind with the plan he has for you. So let's do it, okay? Together. And we'll all be looking out for you. Mark Hine here, Senior Vice President for Student Affairs. Keith Anderson runs our, our student conduct and care offices. Todd Campo leads all these student leaders that moved you in. I lead our convocation services. We're cheering for you. You know, write us, connect with us online. Let's do this together. We're your biggest fans because we've seen God do amazing things through people like you. So, and I would love to pray for you. Uh, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for these students, for these men and these women who are moving into adulthood, who are embarking on this next and new and exciting phase of their life. And I pray for your blessing and for your help. I pray that their anxieties are satiated. I pray that you give them clarity where they are confused. I pray that you help them as they organize their lives to prepare for this semester. I pray that already now that there's some students here in this room that are answering that question, what would I do if I know I will not fail? And that they pursue that thing with all of their might for the rest of their life. I pray that through this class, you do things that are so amazing and so miraculous that in all of history, the only thing that can be said is, God must have done that thing. So thank you for the, for the, the chance we have to be part of this place. And we entrust this class and this season of life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, you are uh, dismissed. You know where to go. you got that checklist. Some of you are going to freshman seminar. Some of you are going to the Keep It Safe seminar. Come to the Chancellor's Cookout tonight to meet our Chancellor. Have a great day. <laughs>